This episode is brought to you by NordVPN. Whether it's real spaceships or those in science fiction, it seems like they are always breaking down and barely being held together by duct tape. So what do we do if our ship breaks down a trillion miles from home? Whether it's crashing a flying saucer into Roswell or Han Solo trying to jumpstart the Millennium Falcon, broken ships are something of a staple of space travel speculation and a regular plot point in science fiction, but they are a very real concern in science and engineering. Spaceships do break a lot, even for all the top-notch engineering we put into them, because they are for extreme conditions and in many ways nearly every single flight is a test flight or a prototype of something. We don't have thousands of routine missions to field test some new widget or feature until it is ultra reliable. The flip side of that is that we would expect that in the future, and so it's surprising how often things break on spaceships in sci-fi, or get sabotaged, or have a backup that's also broken. A quote that comes to mind is from my favorite Starfleet engineer, Chief Miles O'Brien, when he's explaining why he had to replace a component with a lower capacity one to make room for a secondary backup. Well, in order to bring the system up to Starfleet code, I had to take out the couplings to make room for a secondary backup. Starfleet code requires a second backup? In case the first one fails. What are the chances that both a primary system and its backup would fail at the same time? Well, it's very unlikely, but in a crunch I wouldn't like to be caught without a second backup. And have you ever seen the non-stop console explosions and other breaks that seem to happen in every other Star Trek episode, you can sympathize with Chief O'Brien's point. The backups are always failing at the same time the original breaks, in a fashion that even Murphy's Law might find pessimistic. When it rains it pours and the weather in space is even crazier. Now it stands to reason that since we do not live in a science fiction episode, probably, such convenient coincidences aren't getting shoehorned into our script by lazy writing or last minute production changes. However, on an interplanetary voyage lasting a couple years, like those we envision to Mars or other places in the next few decades, or interstellar missions in the further future which might last decades, you do not need the main system and the backup to fail at the same time. Stuff breaks for a reason and whatever circumstance blew the primary out might still be in play for the secondary too. On Deep Space Nine for instance, they are constantly trying to MacGyver up repairs and improvised components for an old space station built by another civilization for another purpose, and if you think trying to read the instructions in a technical manual written in another human language are tricky, an alien one is probably way worse as might be components from your homeworld that were built a light century away and imported to a colony with hundreds of years of language and cultural drift. So it stands the reason that we want backups and of course the reason you don't want them is that they are expensive, both in terms of cost and mass, which is the arch enemy of a spaceship. More mass means more fuel and more maintenance too. Such components are for fixing things, but especially for protracted storage, a lot of sensitive components would need extra efforts or even gear for preserving them. In my opinion, it is very unlikely any manned spaceship leaving Earth orbital space will do so without a 3D printer, the more realistic version of the replicator of Star Trek, and that's likely to cover any relatively simplistic bulk replacement item. More intricate stuff, including circuitry, does not store as well and might get bulky with efforts to keep them safe for use for long periods of years or decades or even centuries. 3D printing though, depending on how intricate it can get, does solve a lot of these problems and is basically why the replicator from Star Trek gets beaten up so much as a horrible thing to have put in the series. There's no reason to bother with backups for anything but your replicators and anything needed to run them or which they can't replicate. They are too convenient and thus too often forgotten of during episodes where they would make the plot pointless. Now conveniently things are always breaking on those shows that the replicators can't replace and in a way that sort of makes sense since your ships might be full of lots of classified or brand new technology on the cutting edge of your science and industry and might be a pain to replicate or just not have a template yet. Bit of a hand wave there but in terms of 3D printing, it is plausible. 
we don't really care if they're carrying case for some bit of technology breaks. Like your phone's case, that is definitely something you could 3D print though, but it's not the urgent thing needing to be fixed because it's cracked. And printing circuit boards is tricky too, they're also something we do, it's just a different device than 3D printer, same as a paper and ink printer. It's debatable if an in-system ship running between planets would need something like that, since it isn't going to be light compared to some backup circuit boards and a soldering gun. I should also note that things like nanobots and universal assemblers are potential options for making anything rather than having a handful of more specialized printers or forges, but it would generally be easier to just include a specialized fabricator or three. Tiny machines will be very slow, it's sort of the nature of that process, see our Santa Claus Machine episode for details, though they are likely to still play a powerful role in self-repairing gear and ships. Key point though, when you're fixing stuff, the backup doesn't have to be the same device, the new widget might be far better than the design from 20 years ago, but that one will work in a pinch and probably is way easier to find a design you can cobble together. The real backup is a database of every component you have on a ship that can be cross-referenced to the devices it appears in or that parallel components appear in, so you know where to cannibalize from. A very good engineer would know many of those or be able to inspect and find them, but that's exactly the sort of thing computers and AI are wonderful at, so you crack open your damaged navigation console and find the W-42 is burned out and the computer tells you if another W-42 is around the ship or if any components of the W-42 are. Now it's hard to say that the future will be a place that's full of highly individualized and tailored components or very standardized ones. Ironically new equipment tends to be a mix of both since we try to cut down on costs and unexpected problems by using tried and true tech and prototypes wherever we can. We can't really say that the future is going to be a place where every single bit of gear is custom tailored to its job from the ground floor up, but such a future is no time soon, and really something I'd only expect in a post-science civilization, or one with technological stagnation, as we discussed in those episodes, where you basically are done innovating because there's no place to innovate or none left where you are willing to risk going, and thus folks have spent centuries retooling every device to optimum performance, including ripping out trivial things like the resistor or capacitor that's 5.32% more massive than it needs to be for one that's exactly 5.32% less, and is manufactured exclusively for this device. The airlock door that was standardized as 10mm thick steel, but after long discussion and regulation, has been peeled back to 9.83mm instead, saving trillions of dollars. And of course, in that sort of economy, everything is about building to last. Because there's nothing new coming out next year that makes something obsolete, so even fairly standardized ship designs are going to often be heavily customized after some individual has owned one for decades and made custom modifications. So you either have a future in which lots of technological components are standardized and shared between many devices, which are constantly being upgraded and innovated on, in which case you have a crazy mess of standardized and custom like everything does nowadays, or you have one in which everything is ultra standardized and individualized as a result. Both have their pros and cons, but neither really implies you've got a backup of every single device and a backup of that backup. More likely, items on that ship get ranked by priority in an emergency, and either you pick a device for that function where all of its bits are easily synthesized by an onboard manufactory or cannibalized from other things, or else you do keep a backup and even a backup backup. Of course another approach is modularity, where it's not that you have backup so much you have tons of the same device doing the job or able to retask to it. You don't have a backup meal, you have a pantry full of food reserves rather than replacements. You don't have a backup captain, you have an XO, and that XO has normal jobs to perform, so does whoever is next in line for command if the captain and XO both get neutralized, or vaporized as the case might have it. I've seen cases in fiction where they had a backup crew on ice in case a member got taken out, but the cases involved are usually where life support is very restricted or where it's a sleeper ship with a dozen awake crew and thousands of frozen colonists so they just thaw out an astronomer if the navigator got killed, or an engineer if the ship engineer went nuts and had to be restrained or put on ice. We could see something like this in a post-human environment of digital uploaded minds, where you and other crew members and colonies exist in a virtual environment or just stored on a hard drive and have an android body or mundane robot you pilot in the ship to do real world tasks. 
The life support and freezing options though raises another issue. It isn't really right to say that interstellar space is cold, the temperature of interstellar gas is often super hot, but it's super thin so it has little heat, even if its temperature is high, so it's quite easier to keep things cold on a ship, and indeed it's pretty easy to keep them warm too, but still costs more energy. The actual temperature of space is not terribly relevant, it's how thin it is since that's what controls cooling by anything other than radiation as infrared photons. With that in mind, if you got a damaged ship and a civilization able to restore frozen people, what you do is make sure your ship either has a printer able to make freezer pods or contains a lot of equipment you can cannibalize for it, and by mass that's going to mostly be the same stuff you make your hole from since it serves the same purpose. In an emergency you freeze everyone you don't absolutely need at that moment, which is eventually everyone if it's an unfixable problem. For that matter, freezing itself or vitrifying is less important in space, radiation shielding around your body to protect your asphyxiated corpse from being mangled by radiation micrometers is probably sufficient to let them revive you if they can revive you from being frozen in the first place. Sci-fi style stasis pods presumably work on freezing time, not bodies, so it would probably be harder to fabricate and run, but easier to restore someone if kept intact, shut it off and they are unfrozen, they don't need to thaw out because time stopped, they didn't actually get icy. So too you might use brain scan and mind upload backups, a distress beacon might be an encrypted update to your brain's last save state back at home base. Outside of colony ships and scouts, which pretty much by definition are a rarity compared to normal traffic over long periods of time, everyone should be on a fairly known path between two inhabited systems. Having a compartment blow out will knock you off course, and by a calculable cone of options for search and rescue, who probably have been getting a constant ID signal from you. If that stops, its absence becomes an SOS even if you've got no beacon. Beacons are not hard to make either and in a situation like that, even a passive beacon in the form of a radar reflective object of clearly artificial geometry is going to be helpful. But we also need to keep in mind that a ship that blew out several tons of superheated gas while traveling at a tenth of light speed between two stars several light years apart might not even have anyone who would notice the normal ID transmitter was gone for a few years, and it might be decades before ships get out there to be able to start tracking you. In practice they probably are waiting for your debris to arrive, or asking some ship on a similar vector to either slow or speed up a bit to see if they can rendezvous with any debris. Indeed, they probably wouldn't ask that ship since that ship is probably the one that first knows the problem and acted on it. Those are your survival time frames in a situation like that though, which is why stuffing people in freezer bags is fairly reasonable, or even just their heads which would be easier to safeguard. Unlike the typical sci-fi portrayal of someone on a spaceship going nuts, the guy running around the ship with an axe or a chainsaw trying to cut people's heads off might be the sane one. You might do that even if your civilization doesn't really have the ability to restore frozen people yet, since they might be able to one day. Otherwise you're drifting and it really comes down to if you still have power or not. If you do, you can put together a beacon and given the timelines you can even train someone in the field of engineering from stored teaching software, so they can make a transmitter because you potentially have years to burn. Same applies for fixing almost any device. Given time, energy, and raw material, you can make it, even if no one on your ship originally even knew what it was. Slow boat colony ships with centuries of journey time can even spend a few centuries breeding back up some good engineers to fix or build their engine to slow down on arrival. If you don't have power, you need to get it, and the good news is that there will almost inevitably be something you could use to power a transmitter because even some weak 20 watt signal that pulses once an hour for a millisecond is going to be trackable once people know to look, which is probably 5 seconds after your normal signal goes offline, plus light lag. This is also the sort of thing computers and AI are perfect for, monitoring 50 million transponders simultaneously for all the ships in the travel corridor and estimating each one's velocity and possible deviation for a search. The bad news though is that putting together a power plant if you haven't got power is a lot harder. In deep space you can hypothetically use giant thin mirrors to concentrate distant sunlight into some sort of power supply, and active sensors looking for it later will spot that giant mirror in an instant anyway, but that just makes you easy to find later, 
and if you haven't got power, your fate is entirely up to others, and if your civilization is able to restore frozen bodies, otherwise you're pretty much limited to rescue by divine providence. You're going to want to stick with that ship too, escape pods are going to be harder to track and are something you use if your ship is actively being shot at, and it's not an ocean going ship that's ramming an iceberg and sinking, so enemy action is the major reason you would abandon ship, and they really shouldn't have any problem tracking those pods either. If your enemy is the sort to take prisoners, they can, if they would rather ignore you and that should be someone else's problem, they can, and they want to target those pods, they certainly can. Of course being taken prisoner might be the worst of various scenarios, but it is why a stealthy escape pod or lifeboat isn't really needed. If they've got a hundred railguns and tracking systems locked on your ship, they aren't going to miss a stealthy little pod because that's exactly what enemy counterfire in the form of a stealthy little missile and torpedoes is going to look like, whereas a clearly visible pod helps friend or foe rescue you and be able to easily track you so they don't have to worry if you're a missile. If your enemy does not take prisoners or does not return them in good condition, so to speak, then you shouldn't be wasting space and mass on life pods that could be spent on more armor and bigger guns. That way you improve the odds your enemy is relying on your sense of honor and mercy, not the other way around, especially as they might not have any. Also, given the technologies we've been discussing, your life pod basically amounts to a convenient shipping box they can pick up and then scan your brain for everything it has, or dump your revived mind into the Matrix, or a virtual nightmare that makes a torture chamber look like a vacation resort. Instead you stay on your ship, no matter how damaged, because it's not drifting through space waiting to explode at any moment and on fire. Anything actually capable of exploding is a potential power source too, whereas generally speaking things which make power aren't really prone to explode, that's more of a notion of old steam engines blowing or early nuclear reactors melting down. We will leave a caveat that a ship running on antimatter could explode if containment was lost, but that's something that should vaporize you instantly with no warning or reaction time if it happens. You're not going to have containment slowly break down, and it is your power source and it's a very easy one to tap if you've got safe storage for it, so you're not losing power to it unless you've run out of the stuff. Your magnets contain the antimatter by having electricity flow through them, and you leak matter out of those to generate power, so it's a fairly straightforward design. Also, it is critical to always remember that when it comes to interstellar spaceships, the energy need to move you up to and down from those kind of speeds dwarfs the amount of energy you need to run life support even on slow boat arc ships. Unless you're going less than 1% of light speed on a ship trying to keep a whole little neo cylinder lit for thousands of years, you didn't need as much energy to run life support as to get up to speed. That generally applies to interplanetary speeds too, they are smaller but the trip durations are too, and when it comes to very core life support like recycling air and water and keeping the heat going, bigger ships are better for this. I know on the show they'll have the Enterprise lose power to life support, and within minutes no one can breathe or they are freezing to death, but on a ship that big they should have days before there's a noticeable drop in temperature or a dangerous uptick in CO2 levels. So the key to good ship design is making sure you have backup power sources that are likely to still be accessible and usable if something blows up and which are scattered about so as to make them hard for a single source of damage or sabotage to get. You get a design philosophy of making sure lots of stuff has batteries and a protocol for keeping them fully charged and compatible with each other. You definitely do not do like they did in Star Trek Voyager and have a holodeck power supply that's not compatible with the rest of the ship, which is a great example of lazy writing when you want to have food rationing, remove replicators from play, and still have side episodes on the holodeck. Your other design philosophy becomes making your big dumb heavy mass useful stuff. When it comes to radiation shielding for example, there's no particular reason sheets of metal couldn't be made of spare parts or feedstock for your printers or even batteries instead of just dumb metal. Bulletproof batteries as components of armor has been discussed in a lot of speculation for combat body armor or exoskeletons and this general dual role is always advantageous whenever you need to keep your kit or cargo light, 
even when the thing in question might not be optimal for either role because twice as much of it does both jobs better. This option is better when cost is less important than mass and when operations are far from resupply. It also works better when multiple roles are either freebies or likely to be done. So having the hubcaps of your car built to be used as emergency shovels or expandable fuel drums sounds neat, but it's hard to imagine you would need that function very often, and it's likely to make for an expensive hubcap that doesn't do its hubcapping job as well. Alternatively it's pretty normal for soldiers to replace their shoelaces with 550 parachute cord or wrap it around the hilts of knives, or at least it was when I was in the army, because it does both of those jobs well and now you've got a nice cheap sturdy rope able to hold 550 pounds on it and it made for nice boot laces and wrappings for tools. Since you often have to carry all your gear with you and you want as many tools and options as possible, anything that's light or multi-use is really nice even if it's not really very good for a given use, since it will get the job done with a little extra skill or effort. A multi-tool in your kit is great, so is a Swiss Army knife, but a workshop with those individual tools in large non-compact form is much better, just not very mobile. In the same vein of thought, you probably try to aim to make sure that your packaging for things is easily recyclable into feedstock for your printers or forges, Picking water bottles that can be converted into airtight hole patches probably isn't worth paying 10 times as much or using a substance that's much heavier or worse at being a water bottle, but hunting for those occasions where a dual or multi-use is viable is what will be an important trait for a ship's quartermaster or the consultants or companies designing loadouts or making gear back on Earth. Now that takes us to ships crashing on Earth, and of course we need to start by pointing out that this is a strange case. We don't really expect spaceships to land on planets themselves, though crashing on a planet might be another story. That's also assuming the modern conditions of spaceflight and future ships might be configured for air and space, or they might be highly modular and able to restructure, truly that's quite plausible. In the vacuum, aerodynamic shaping isn't very important, but those are long journeys and plenty of time to reconfigure a ship. Indeed a shuttle able to alter form while in flight to optimize based on current speed and air conditions with something like memory metal or parallel options would be invaluable to a good space plane. Note that an actual saucer shape like the classic UFO is not a good vehicle for air travel, and we're including it today in discussion because flying saucers and crashes are so often central to discussion of crashed spaceships. Now the saucer is not a great shape with modern flight in mind, but it would not be unfair to rebut that something like anti-gravity technology or abundant fuel with ultra-high exhaust velocities or which circumvented the rocket equation can get around this shape issue. Indeed, we were talking about how to do that last week when we were contemplating if you could own your own personal spaceship. Anti-grav or superior fuels basically lets you casually drop through an atmosphere rather than having to squeeze every drop of fuel for all it can offer and break using air drag. We do not have these so we have to squeeze every penny, but this is exactly what an advanced civilization would want for its spaceships and aircraft, and they would be researching it if they had any plausible scientific leads to those technologies or materials, so if it is possible they will probably have it. Also, if your ship is crashing into a planet, it might be an unplanned trip entirely, and a saucer shape is fine for a void craft not planning to be in the air much. There's a lot of pros and cons to many different shapes for vehicles, saucers are not generally considered great candidates but often it would depend on the situation. For instance a ring is a great shape for a ship for crew accommodations to spin it for artificial gravity and that becomes a saucer if you cover the empty middle and use it for lower gravity facilities and storage. And while spin gravity implies that you haven't got anti-gravity technology, since you'd be using gravity plating in the ship or something like that, it is worth noting that such technologies probably burn energy, while spinning a ship doesn't once it's going. Just because a civilization can manipulate gravity doesn't mean they do it everywhere. Same as we don't stop using windows for lighting just because we invented candles and light bulbs. That's a thing to remember when discussing topics like this and futurism in general, sometimes the technology utterly eliminates a problem, other times it might seem like it would but then it doesn't. Televisions are now comparable in price to windows for instance, but we don't do a lot of TV window swaps in houses 
and folks often thought we would in old or sci-fi, same as TV also didn't get rid of radio or books. On a spaceship though, windows might be rarities, in favor of the main viewer approach we saw on the bridges of Star Trek vessels. Anyway, when it comes to a ship landing or crashing, whether or not it survives atmospheric entry is all about how good their metals and controls are. Folks talk about ships burning up as they fall from orbit and being shattered if they hit, but that's assuming it's not a super material, and if your civilization had those, then that's probably what your ship hull is made from. And need not be that super of a material either. It's weird to imagine something that better resembles the child of a skyscraper in a mountain than an airplane surviving a plummet from orbit, but that's not actually that weird. Indeed, most of the destruction is from decelerating from orbital speed, not the drop itself, which presumably ends with the object impacting at what we call terminal velocity, which is badly named as folks assume it has to do with dying, which admittedly often would be the case for anyone hitting the ground at terminal speed, but rather it's just the maximum speed a given shape can have for a given gravity and atmosphere, and its own weight, where the air drag counters the pull of gravity as air drag increases sharply with speed. One minor caveat on that though, not only does an object have to slow down if it's moving at orbital speed, rather than just hovering above the planet as sci-fi spaceships often do, but there does need to be enough air in its path to slow it, which means an actual solid mountain dropping on the planet is not going to be cushioned much by the air, let alone slowed from orbital speeds, as is the case with big asteroids. Alternatively, almost anything hollow like a ship will be, but if one is big enough, like a Super Star Destroyer, that should not be taken for granted. Regardless, terminal speeds are shape-based and not high compared to ship speeds, for instance bullets, which are aerodynamic and have a high terminal velocity as a result, often have terminal speeds of 45 to 60 meters per second, or 100 to 134 miles per hour. A human in belly flop attitude is generally about 120 miles per hour and in head dive attitude potentially as high as 180 miles per hour, or 80 meters per second. You can definitely build something, even with modern materials, that is going to survive that, and it is worth noting that spaceships are likely to be built with forward collision in mind, and if the ship had managed to slow to terminal speed, we are in the realm where something can be built tough enough to handle that collision. We also have to contemplate the option for drag chutes being built from hyper-strong materials, and the characteristic of a drag chute or parachute made from something as strong as graphene can actually get away with enormous chutes for little mass, or ones with enormous tensile strength that won't be shredded by the force of supersonic air. Whether or not the crew survives that is a lot harder to say, but an airbag and seatbelt combination could save you at that collision speed, and it's not hard to imagine improvements on that. I recently rewatched the first episode of the old My Favorite Martian TV show from the 60s, where Ray Walston is playing a Martian known as Uncle Martin to a local reporter who found his crashed ship and is helping him try to get what he needs to repair it. He had been on Earth as an anthropologist studying us, and in practice you would think he could just signal Mars, especially as they should be wondering what happened to him, but the thing about an unexpected UFO crashing on Earth, saucers or whatever, is that we're assuming it is an authorized mission. The joke often goes that it seems weird a spaceship could cross trillions of kilometers of space, then break down the last hundred in our atmosphere, but in practice that's pretty plausible. Coasting through space is certainly the most likely time for damage as a whole because it's a long period, but also gives you lots of time to fix things, and it is only more likely because there's so much more of it. Slamming on the brakes in a thick atmosphere is way more likely, meter for meter, to damage your ship and that's assuming it was in good shape. Something we've often discussed in other episodes is that the normal reasons given for why a UFO came to Earth tend not to work out well on contemplation. As I like to say, if you want to collect human DNA, you do not abduct people, you abduct a vending machine or post box and take DNA off the coins and letters instead. Reasons that tend to make more sense are hard, but some examples we've come up with are smugglers sneaking onto planets to steal unique trade items for a collector's market, which means they get down here and raid museums or flea markets or comic book stores or garbage heaps for memorabilia, 
and they are probably rather marginal operations who can't really expect to get repairs at the local alien navy base. You're Han Solo and Chewbacca sort of situation, but they're here to get mint condition collectible action figures of Han and Chewie to sell to aliens who prize primitive world collectibles before they've made contact with the wider galaxy. And they're not getting shot at by anyone because the quarantine isn't that tight, you get a fine and jail time if they catch you, and the sales are all black market too, so they want you for tax evasion, but unless their monitors start picking up blatant violations like taking over Earth or dancing around in front of news crews in Times Square, they're not falling over themselves to hunt you down. Obviously a case better suited for story than fact, but it is a more logically plausible reason for why an alien ship might crash on Earth. Their ship is poorly maintained and they're dodging patrols and scans, albeit half-hearted ones that might be okay with a little bribery, and they cut corners once too often and the ship slams into the ground, also known as litho-breaking. But they are a high-tech species, so even though their ship is a relative hunk of garbage, they still have their civilization's apex tech all over. Same as some rust bucket car from the 1980s still has the owner's smartphone and Bluetooth radio in it. And I imagine in that case that the norm is going to be a fairly impressive 3D printer, though that might be up on the mothership and your shuttle to the planet hasn't got one. But then that ship probably has a drone that you could order to come bring you one. In the event of being a crashed alien on a low-tech planet, odds are pretty decent you are not entirely flesh and blood, and if you've been smuggling on that planet then it's very likely you do it in some android body designed to look like a human. Or maybe a dog. Your ship also probably does not have a cloaking field to make it look like a police box, or something locally mundane, but it wouldn't exactly be strange to have camo netting on your ship or some sort of chameleon hull either. Crashes in terms of air-going vehicles also aren't quick either, you've got minutes worth of plummeting and failures before you hit to make sure you're strapped in and your airbag is active, though an ejection seat is plausible too. By default of course those aren't supposed to be subtle, a crash vehicle wants to be highly visible to get attention and help, and a crash spaceship ought to be ultra visible, or at least the mushroom cloud erupting around mount it would be. But in a case like this, stealthy crashes are reasonable. I could imagine a flying saucer for instance was actually an ejection pod on a bigger ship or shuttle, and the ship itself took the crash or detonated in a way to make it look like an asteroid while the escape pod tried for a stealthy landing. Given the time and distance involved this might not be at the same time either. Not that a saucer is a great ship for that purpose, but it's not terrible. And for the record I'm an ultra skeptic on aliens visiting Earth because I don't think there are any in this galaxy. I tend to take for granted if they existed and could visit they would, and we wouldn't need to debate if they had, any more than we need to debate the existence of any foreign nation on this planet for instance. And if such a ship were recoverable in any way, even if it was a garbage scow by their civilization standards, that thing would still be worth a hundred times its weight in gold and back engineering's technology would be too important and too useful to waste time on secrecy, in my opinion. It might make for good stories or alien theories, but it's a bad strategy to me. So to me that's a reasonable case, if a crash ship survived we would find it a gold mine and there was a good chance it would survive. Now as to what an alien who crashed here and escaped their ship would do, stranded on a primitive ward without their ship or gear, that's another topic for another time. One thing we didn't really touch on today was all the vectors that damage might come from and some are less obvious like someone hacking your control systems or doing a ransomware strike on your navigation data. It's always hard to imagine what the internet will look like in the future or in a multi-planet civilization, but I can't imagine it being any less intertwined into our existence than nowadays, and the internet and the digital world are now a sphere of our existence the same as the ground we walk on or the atmosphere we breathe, and security inside it is every bit as important as physical security, that's where a virtual private network or VPN like NordVPN can help so that every random web page you visit and every hacker who visits them doesn't know your IP address and other data, and use them to hurt you. Encrypting your personal traffic makes it harder for others to spy on or attack you, just like having curtains on your windows and locks on your door. NordVPN makes it easy to encrypt your data anywhere and send it through any of their 5400 servers in 59 different countries, 
You can even double route your data through two servers for extra encryption, and there is an automatic kill switch to protect you in case the connection drops. NordVPN is also easy to use, you can turn it on with one click or even automatically, it works on up to 6 devices and on different platforms like Windows, Android, iOS, macOS, Linux, and even your Android TV. No more bandwidth throttling, no more geo restrictions on shopping or which videos and games you can play based on location, and NordVPN's threat protection upgrade offers an enhanced layer of protection against malware, intrusive ads, and web trackers. You can check out their website to learn all the benefits NordVPN offers, just go to nordvpn.com slash IsaacArthur to get a 2 year plan plus 4 additional months with a huge discount, it's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. Incidentally someone asked me recently if I consider doing more current events material for spaceships, what's going on and what more near term ship innovations are on the radar and I think we might do a deeper dive into upcoming spaceship technologies the next couple of decades, but for current events, there's already a lot of great space channels like Marcus House, Scott Manley, Launchpad Astronomy, or Everyday Astronaut, and if you've never seen any of their episodes, they've all got amazing catalogs of shows, and make sure to give them a like and subscribe while you're at it. Speaking of episodes, today is an example of an episode that was inspired by another one and which I started writing a follow up to almost as soon as I finished writing and recording this one, and we'll be contemplating the case of being stranded on an alien world, or four different cases of it, in our Sci-Fi Sunday episode on November 13th. Before we get to November though, we have our live stream Q&A coming up this Sunday, October 30th at 4pm Eastern Time, and I hope you'll join me and my wife and co-host Sarah as we answer your questions from the live chat. Next week though, we'll start November off by looking at how we might extend our sun's lifespan by refueling our sun so it can continue for many billions or even trillions of more years. Then the week after that we will turn to a more modern time frame as we contemplate what automated economies will really look like and how they might affect unemployment. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.